My guest today is a former member of the band Blitz Kid, formerly known by the name of TB Monstrosity. And he is now the lead singer of the band, a gathering of known. Please welcome Tracy Bird. Hi, Tracy. How are you? Good, good, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. All right. First, uh, I would like to know how music came into your life and who inspired you. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. It started, I started to discover music, I guess, when I was, you know, in... Um, what we call here in the States, um, elementary school, you know, primary school. And, um, and then around that time I was in, I was like maybe eight or nine and I started getting into bands like ACDC and Guns N' Roses and stuff like that. Stuff that was popular, you know, and, you know, current at the time. And from there, as I got more into it, I got more into bands like, Megadeth, Slayer, um, you know, and a lot of the hair and metal stuff and everything like that. So in that time, I decided that I wanted to learn how to play drums. And so, <coughs> excuse me, my father uh, bought me a, a snare drum, and that was that was it. You know, I, I wanted a drum kit, but my father, um, we could only afford a snare drum <laughs> at the time. So what I would do is I would... I would sit in front of my in front of my radio and I would play along to songs, essentially air drumming them. And by the time that I was able to get a, a full drum kit, I knew how to play drums because I'd been, you know, mastering the coordination and the uh the motions of playing a regular drum kit so much that I already had, you know, the movements. And from there, I was playing drums, and then I decided, well, I like guitar, too, so I want to play guitar. I bought a $30 guitar off of my Uncle Mike, who was uh, a guitar player, and it was an old harmony guitar, and I started learning chords from books and things like that, sort of trying to, you know, take my way through some of my favorite songs. And from there, I actually got some lessons. I took about six formal lessons, and... um After that, I just, there was no looking back. After that, I knew how to play guitar, I knew how to play drums, and it just snowballed from there. That's that's how I got involved in music. I, I started playing the drums when I was about 12, and then I started playing drums and guitar when I was 13, and I was in my first band by the time I was 14 years old. Next question for you, Tracy. How important is music in your life? Music is everything. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it goes, it goes, uh, you know, family, friends, then music. Music is, and more often than not, sometimes music is the first thing. Uh, but as you get older and priorities change, music becomes kind of secondary to everything else you have going on in your life. But there's not a day that goes by that I'm not listening to music, playing music, you know, searching for new music, new bands, new artists. So without music, I, I really don't know what would, what would become of me if I didn't have that outlet, you know, to express myself. And to, you know, it's something that I, that I definitely value, and it's very important in my life. I want to hear you about the Blitz Kid year. How can you explain the success of this band? Uh, because it's not a major band, but uh, with the, all you have, You have done something very great. You know that, and that you know, and let me start by saying that that that's something that we never expected. We never expected when we started Blitz Kid. It was just because we were, you know, three guys in a small town in Southwest Virginia who just wanted to have something to do and wanted to, you know, be around people that were like you know us and you know, liked metal and punk rock and, you know, fringe culture and things like that. So we didn't really have a plan with Blitz Kid. It just kind of, it just kind of, we just kind of started the band and then we just started playing shows. And from there, it just, it just took a life, a life of its own. And I can't believe I get messages to this day from people all over the world 
who are like, oh, I'm a huge fan of Blitzkid. Your music has meant so much to me. And we never expected that we would have that kind of success or impact on people. We were just doing it because we wanted to do it. So the fact that it started from such an innocent place and has become this part of the pun, has become this huge monster now that, you know, people are still discovering even six years after we've been broken up. It's amazing. You know, it's it's one of the greatest gifts, you know, I have in, in my life that people have been affected by something that we started, you know, because we just wanted to have something to do and we wanted to express ourselves in that way. And it's just become such a bigger thing than we ever thought it would. So that's, you know, and, you know, we never made a lot of money. And like you said, we never made, you know, we never were a huge band. But in the underground, I think we definitely made an impact that we didn't even expect to make. So that's awesome. So, in a past interview with Agile Goldsby, he said to me that the song Pretty in the Gasket is the major hit of the band. Because in this show, um, you can play this song uh, two, maybe three times. <laughs> so, But he, he cannot explain uh, why the success of this song. So, can you explain <laughs> the success of this song? I think I think the success is you know, pretty in a casket is simply because it's It's so catchy and it's so, you know, you re it's so repetitive that that title itself, Pretty in the Casket, is repeated so many times throughout the song that people can't help but latch on to it and it becomes something that they want to sing along to and then becomes something that they identify with, you know, the band Blitz Kid. And as the Gluzi was saying, initially, we didn't, it's not that we didn't like the song, we just didn't think that it was going to have the mileage that it's gotten. We kind of thought, like I said, we kind of thought, well, it's kind of repetitive and, you know, it's just kind of the same stuff over and over, but, but, it's a, but it was a fun song when we started playing it out live and we, no, we noticed more, the more and more we played it, the more and more people were responding to it. So, you know, from there, when we were recording um, what became Terrifying Tales, that was one of the songs that we wanted to put on the album, but again, we weren't sure if we were going to do it because with the gloves kind of repetitive it's kind of one of the more simple songs on the album. If it goes on there, maybe we shouldn't do it. And it was Goolsby and Dr. Stu at the time who had, you know, really lobbied for, no, oh, man, we should put that song on the album because it's catchy and people can sing along to it. You know, don't worry about it being simple. It's That's what people want. And so I said, yeah, you know what? You're right. Let's, let's, let's throw it on there and see what happens. And, You know, lo and behold, it became one of our most popular songs. So I'm glad that they kind of talked me into, you know, putting it on the album. And I'm glad that people, again, to this day, still respond to that song. So maybe that's why, it's because it's so catchy and it's so repetitive and it's simple and it's easy to remember, that people just automatically gravitate to it because it has that hook going throughout the song that you can't escape, really. It's just... You know, the the line, Pretty in a Casket, is also a very cool title. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's maybe why it has it has had the success that it has, because, again, it's just, it's a cool title. It's something that's easy for people to latch on to and they can sing along to it. And it's, you know, it fits it fit perfectly what we did at the time. So I think that's why it's so successful. Okay, all right. So... You and Gulzi have reunited for many shows in the past. Uh, do you think it's possible there will be another reunion for a new album, uh, new music on uh, an event, a tour maybe? You know, I don't know if there will be a new album, um, but I definitely think, you know, a, I don't know about a tour either, but I think that, you know, from time to time, there is absolutely no reason now where we are in our personal lives that we can't get together and play a few songs and make make ourselves and a lot of people happy because I think now we're at a place individually where we kind of are doing what we want to do as far as our own projects, but we also recognize the importance that Blitzkid has for not only for our fans, but for us as well. So it's always going to be in the back of our minds, I think, to maybe do some stuff here and there 
But, you know, when that happens, I don't know. Okay. Now I want to talk about your new band, A Gathering of Known. Tell me the story of how this band started. Well, the band started with just me. Um, it was just a project, uh, a name for a project that I wanted to do. I had some songs that I had written that didn't really fit Blitz Kid. And this was toward the end of Blitz Kid. Um, or any other band that I was in at the time. I was also in a band called Vigora for a while, the Automatons I played with for a bit as well. And these songs that I was writing didn't really fit anything that any of those bands did and were kind of just more personal influences for myself and just stylistically so different than anything I had done. I said, well, I should just do something completely new once Blitz Kid ended. And so I started... Um, Yeah, you know, write, writing more songs. And I came up with about eight, with eight, eight songs that I thought I could go in and record myself. So I did that. And then, because the first gathering of non-EP, Purging Into Promises, is all me. I did all the instruments. I did all the vocals. I did everything. And so once that happened, I said, well, you know, it needs a name. You know, I didn't want to call it just, you know, Tracy Bird or... TV or TV monstrosity because it what it what didn't fit specifically the TV monstrosity thing it didn't fit that moniker so I said well it needs a, a completely different name as well and I thought it would be clever at the time to call it a gathering of none because it was just myself <laughs> <laughs> now um, the name still kind of fits what we do as a band because we're now a five piece band we're now a fully functioning five piece band, but now the name fits fits differently because there are so many genres that we flirt with. There are so many influences that we all individually bring to the table that it's still a gathering of none. You know, it's a gathering of a lot of things, but it's also a gathering of none because there's no genre in what we do. There are certain aspects of a lot of genres but there's not one specific one. That's why we still say, you know, a gathering of none works as a band name because it's not one specific thing. How will you describe your music style and your band? Wow. Um, well, going back to that last question, as I said, we do a lot of genre jumping around and, um, you know, there's not one set style that we do. It's kind of all over the place given, like I said, our individual influences as a five piece, all five of us listen to a lot of the same music, but all five of us listen to a lot of different music as well. Um, so if I had to nail it down, if I had to describe it in a few words, as far as stylistically, I would say it's alternative metal slash rock. And that's, that's, that's a pretty, that's a pretty broad spectrum, but I think that would fit best because, you know, in that alternative metal slash rock category, especially for a gathering of none, we have elements of stoner rock, we have elements of post hardcore, we have elements of punk still, grunge, um, all 90s alternative rock. The biggest thing that I hear about a gathering of none is that it reminds people of the 90s, of music that they grew up on. And that's kind of where I wanted to come from with it. So it's cool that people are identifying you know, the sounds and the influences as being from that period because that was the time period when I was a teenager where I was discovering all forms of different music that I loved, but I just didn't know how to interpret them into any songwriting. Now as I'm older and everybody else in the band is a bit older as well, we can all kind of, you know, mix and match what we like from that era and from modern stuff too. It's not just, you know, it's not just the 90s that we draw influence from, but it's easier for us to interpret those influences now and make it something cohesive. So again, I guess a gathering of none is a very um, strong alternative metal slash rock band with several different genres attached. <laughs> Previously this year, you launched Your last album name, One Last Grabs at Hope. In your opinion, which song is the best on the album and why? 
Um, man, that's a tough question because I know, and I know you probably hear this a lot when you interview bands or artists or whatnot, but asking me to pick a favorite song on that record is kind of like asking me to pick a favorite child. Um, <laughs> Because they all we we sat we sat on a lot of those songs for almost for almost three years before we actually recorded them. So they went through various demo phases and various you know various rewrites and various reworkings. And the end result I thought was amazing. Um, it's a it's a it's our strongest release to date for sure. But if I had to pick one song and why. Um, it would probably be Break My Stride because that was a song that we all initially were kind of not all that into. And we thought, well, it's kind of, it needs something. And everybody kind of started throwing ideas in when we got to, you know, record the album for that specific song, whether it be vocal harmonies or, you know, a a break in a song here or a different riff pattern here or whatnot. Everybody was throwing that, throwing around ideas. So that song kind of took on a completely different vibe and a life of its own. And, you know, to me, it's probably, lyrically, it's probably the darkest song on the album because it deals with kind of, um, what's the word? It kind of deals with looking inside yourself and kind of realizing that you know, you feel like there's a lot of people that bring you down within your life. But when you look at it objectively, you're the person that's causing all your problems. So that's kind of a very, it's a very heavy, very heavy, very dark song lyrically because of that. And I think the vibe that we got when we recorded it kind of fits those lyrics perfectly. And it says a lot without, without saying, without saying, so much. It's, it's a very simple arrangement, but there's so many things that we added to the song that makes that arrangement so open and so epic, so to speak, that that song really stood out for me by the time we finished recording because, as I said, you know, we all were kind of like, well, this song's kind of boring in places. It kind of needs something. And by the time we threw all of our individual ideas in and had the arrangement and got everything recorded, we were all blown away. We were just like, oh, my God, the song is probably, you know, one of our favorites on the album now. And I speak for myself when I say that it's my favorite, but, you know, I don't know what the other guy's favorite would be, but that was definitely a song that we all kind of agreed, you know, started out as something that was kind of like, eh, it's okay, to, oh, my God, this is awesome. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that, that, I think that's my favorite song because, to me, it also solidified the bond that we have as a band to come together and, you know, throw so many ideas at a song and we pick the ones that work and we communicate great with one another. We all get along great. And the end result was a great song. So that, that's why that one means the most to me. Is there any possibility that you and the band will be touring Canada anytime soon? You know, there's talk of it. Um, the thing with the gathering of Dunn is, you know, I don't know how many of your listeners or how many people that are familiar with us even know, but we are not in a typical band situation by any means. I live in uh, New England in the United States. Our guitar player, Jeff, lives in New Jersey. Our drummer, Ken and Chris, both still live in Virginia, where we're from, where I'm, where I'm originally from. And our guitar player, Justin, who incidentally produced our new album, did an amazing job, um, is in San Antonio, Texas. So when we do shows, it's something that requires a lot of planning and a lot of, you know, vacation time from work and things like that. <laughs> so, so, we've, so we've talked about poss the possibility of doing more shows as a band. Logistically, though, right now, it's, you know, we have to pick and choose when we, where we go and when we go because of those, those obstacles that we have in our way. It's not a situation of where everybody kind of lives in the same town or just a couple of towns over from one another. We have several states separating all of us. So there's a lot of group messages on Facebook. There's a lot of texts. There's a lot of, hey, I got this idea. Check this out on Dropbox. 
you know, when we're writing songs and stuff like that. And um, even to record the new album, everybody had to make sure that they had time off of work so we could all meet down in Virginia and record at um, our bass player Ken's house. We actually recorded in his house. He has a studio in his basement. So we recorded completely for free. And Justin, our guitarist in San Antonio, is an audio engineer for a living. So he produced and engineered our album in addition to playing on it and singing and singing background vocals as well. So it's it's a situation that's that's definitely not unique now in the in the in this day and age of the internet, but it's not a typical band situation in so much as like I said, we can't just, you know, go twenty minutes down the street and I'll be at you know, one of their houses or something like that. So we have to pick and choose where, when we can play and where we can play and how often right now because of that. But at some point we have discussed that we would like to do some more shows. And, yes, I would love to go to Canada. I know the guys would love to go to Canada also. And we've also tried um, – we've also been ex- expressing interest to various people over in Europe about possibly getting over there as well. What's next for you and the Ben? What's next for us in the band is um, we actually, <laughs> it's funny, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day. I was, like, I was like, yeah, you know, we released the record in April and we're already, you know, bouncing ideas off of one another uh, with new songs. And so we're already kind of writing our new album. So that's in the immediate next for us. Um, we've talked about going out and possibly playing some shows in the Southwest, uh, Texas, maybe uh, New Mexico maybe even California sometime in the spring. So that's, those are the immediate plans. Um, whether they happen immediately, probably not. It'll, be, <laughs> it'll depend on, you know, when we can get some time off work and everybody can, you know, take some time from their jobs and their families and go out on the road and do the rock and roll thing. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy Bird, thank you very much for your time. It's always a pleasure uh, to talk about the Blitzkid year because for a lot of people, uh, you talk about that, I talk about that uh, too. Um, Blitzkid uh, was one of the favorite group in the underground style and the underground uh, scene in the past. And uh, it's, it's beautiful to see you and Argyle uh, do something new in uh, your different way. But I think... For all the Blitzkid fans, uh, we we just want to see you and Argyle reunite for maybe another album, just maybe uh, at least one last album. <laughs> well, like I said, you know, never say never. Um, we've we've not talked about anything like that or anything, but we we are still we are still friends. You know, we we still we still keep in contact, and you know. When a gathering of none was out in July, we actually played two shows with Goolsby's new band, and we got up on stage and we did some um, Blitzkid songs because our, my drummer Chris also plays for Argyle's acoustic acoustic band, The Hollow Body, and you know we've all been friends since we were you know in our early twenties. Me, me and Chris, me and Chris, we go back to being friends since we were thirteen years old. So. It was cool for the fans, I think, that they got to see the original, you know, the, the original first Blitzkid lineup actually do a few songs at those two shows back in July. And it was fun for us, too, because that was the first time the three of us had played as, quote-unquote, the original Blitzkid lineup in, gosh, probably probably almost 20 years. So it was kind of, it was very cool. And um I think... At some point, we'll probably we'll probably do some shows or something. It's just a matter of logistics and everybody having the time to do it. Um, a new album, like I said, I don't know. Um, but the fact that people still, you know, love that band so much and love what we did, that they still want to see it, is definitely a blessing. And it's and it's cool to see that they're so receptive to our own, you know, new projects as well. Because the way I look at that is even though there's no more Blitzkid, there's still TV. He's still doing music. There's still Goolsby. He's still doing music. So we're still doing what we're supposed to do, just not together. We're doing it separately now. So, you know, you not only get one great band, you get two. TV, thanks again for your time and uh, continue to play uh, your music like you do. I'll do it until I can't no more, dude. <laughs>